Consumer expectations have never been higher. But with the evolving economic and competitive pressures, it's getting harder for brands to deliver the kind of consistent, compelling experiences that keep customers loyal. Can operations and facilities leaders find ways to meet these demands while growing their footprint and ultimately drive revenue? Let's find out. Welcome to Elevating Brick and Mortar, a show that discusses the crucial role that facilities, construction, and operations play in designing and delivering a compelling customer experience. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Season 3 of Elevating Brick and Mortar. Thank you for joining us. I am here today with Wade Allen, EVP of Strategic Growth at Costa Vida. Wade, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Sid. Thanks. Great to be here. So, Wade, for folks in our audience who might not be familiar with the brand, can you tell us a bit more about Costa Vida? You bet. Costa Vida is a fast, casual um, Mexican Baja grill. Um, and the, the focus of us, our, our organization is bringing uh, fresh Mexican food in a Baja style to the United States. And, and we are mostly centered in and around the Western U.S. So you'll find us in Utah, Arizona, Colorado, Texas, a little bit in Canada. Um, been around about 20 years and uh, great fresh Mexican cuisine, big burritos, big bold salads, great flavors, awesome queso, and a fantastic desserts. I love it. So as EVP of strategic growth, what are you responsible for? So my focus is on IT marketing, off-premise analytics. That's really where I spend the bulk of my time and really strategically thinking about how we're going to create growth for our brand through those different uh, departments and channels of our business. Really where my passion lies is around that tech marketing kind of collision, the off-premise yeah. world that's now exploded. Yeah. You know, I've actually heard you speak at a couple of events before, right? Specifically the, the Mertech conferences. Um, and I'd love for you to share your journey with us. Like what got you to the role that you're in today and, and what attracted you to the hospitality industry? Yeah, man, I wish I could say it was planful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like most things in life are going to fall into it, right? Uh, That's right. Um, I, I was, I, I had left business school and was working for agencies across the country doing kind of different mobility and digital stuff. I was just getting out of a startup organization that had been sold to a large um, media conglomerate, WPP, if you know who they are. And as I was exiting that, I, I bumped into a colleague who said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm consulting with a Brinker International and man, they could really use your skill set. They, they're, they're struggling with trying to figure out what to do with their, with their marketing and making it more digital. They're struggling with um, the blue sky capabilities going to mobility. They really don't understand this space. And so I, I had an interview. Next thing I knew, I, I was a vice president of marketing, kind of leading their digital charge. And I was with that organization for four, uh, four different roles, 10 different years uh, with them consecutively. And uh, last March, um, I parted ways with Brinker and uh, came to Costa Vida and couldn't be more excited. Costa Vida is a much smaller brand than uh, Chili's and Amagiano's of Brinker, about a hundred restaurants, but man, the, the passion I have for the hospital, hospitality space now for, for uh, being in it over 10 years is just everything for me. I love it. I, I it's sensational. I love the people in it. Uh, and there's still tons of opportunity for growth uh, in the restaurant space. That's fantastic. Thank you. So you, you've had senior leadership roles in customer engagement, innovation, and transformation. Um, you know, can you share with our audience like, what excites you about this business and, and why do you do what you do? You know, I, I've always been a very outgoing, uh, well-connected person just as a kid. I love the people aspect of this business. It's, it's one of the few, comp a few industries where you manufacture and immediately sell it. It's not stored on a shelf. It doesn't go to some warehouse, like you're in the moment and you can see people's eyes and smiles as you're going through this process. And I, I think there's something about sharing a meal uh, and that hospitable component that just draws me every day. I love the, um, the tech opportunity in this space. I think for years it was underserved. Now there's a lot today that's here, but it draws me every day to create innovation, create new things, uh, meet guests' needs at, at at a point in time where our guests are constantly on their phones, constantly pressed for time, 
constantly looking for um, innovative food that they can take with them. And that's where my passion lies. I love that aspect. And I think there's a huge opportunity to continue to serve this industry there. Wait, as you look at the, you know, Costa Vida brand and you, you've been there for a few months now, what kind of impact are you looking to make and what kind of experience are you looking to deliver to your, to your, to your consumer? One of the things I've identified as I've come in is building process, um, really get them focused on operational excellence. Um, you know, team member engagement is critical for this organization. We got to, we got to ground ourselves there. We got to build some brand standards and consistency. Um, and then we ultimately got to build, like we talked about, like I talked about a minute ago, process and system improvements. So I'm focused on those three things. The brand is fantastic. It has all fresh foods. In fact, I, I don't believe we have freezers in our restaurants, right? Everything wow. gets freshly prepared. Um, it is a, a really phenomenal experience. And if you haven't tried it, you should. It's, it's pretty remarkable. But they've had that a aspect of delicious food, uh, great hospitality, and high quality ingredients. I think what they have lacked has been that kind of process structure, brand standards, and team member engagement. So that's where I'm highly focused. And that, that's where I'm, uh, I think this brand can unlock a uh, trajectory not unlike some of the bigger brands that you've seen take off after being around for 20 years and have and now reached thousands of units. Uh, that's what drew me here. And that's what I'm actively working on now as I, as I begin to lead uh, over the next nine months, uh, kind of establishing what we're going to do. So when you look at the industry as a whole, right, um, and the hospitality space, what, what should the North Star be for, you know, any brand? Uh, and, and what do you think, you know, just having the experience that you have, what brings the customer back? The expectations in, in dining actually aren't very high, believe it or not. Um, I, I think, I think many of us can probably relate That's actually going after through COVID it's gotten to a place where they just want to have a great meal at a great value, a place where they can either gather with friends and family or something that they can take off premise and, and that every item is right. And they have everything that they wanted in that bag or sack or container. Um, and so I think that's the challenge. The, the, the challenge today in, in, in dining, whether it's in your restaurant or out of your restaurant, is creating that optimal guest experience. And I, I think what keeps the guests coming back is just meet the expectation. I'm not asking for balloons and a party or, right. you, know, see, you know, fine dining may be a little bit different. But for fast casual, it's a quick bite to eat in a clean restaurant that's well-maintained, or it's a quick and efficient way to get the food home to my kids so that um, my, and I can speak from experience, my son who has autism doesn't lose his marbles because we forgot his chicken nuggets, right? That's the thing that we can't have happen in dining. So I talk about low expectations. I actually think low is probably the wrong word. It's just, they're not, they're not grandiose or outrageous. And we as restaurant companies, if we can just meet those expectations, our guests will continue to be loyal. It's when right. we screw that up, don't admit it, continue to sweep it aside, blame DoorDash or blame the, somebody else that, that our guests, guests get frustrated. And, and that's when we lose it. Yeah. You know, I want to talk about some macro trends and, you know, especially like what has happened over the past three years. But before we go there, um, can you share your views on the role of design and construction and architecture and facilities in delivering, you know, a, your brand promise? Because a lot of the folks in our audience are, you know, from those functions. And many times it's not really evident uh, at, you know, at the C-level, um, the C-suite as to what impact they have, where in fact, I believe there's a huge impact, right? But what are your thoughts on that? Oh, it's huge. It's, it's everything. I mean, uh, well, I, I talk a lot about tech and innovation and marketing. The reality is people don't choose a restaurant <clears throat> or a place to eat unless it's clean, well-maintained. It's, uh, it's, it's got the integrity that you want when you walk in. Because the moment that you walk into that restaurant, most guests, whether they can overtly see it or they just subvertly kind of know something's wrong, they can tell. The, yeah. the paint's off. Things aren't right. It's old. It's got an odd smell. It's not been cleaned. Right? So... The, the, the building, the facilities, the care of the, of the unit itself, as well as all of the cooking, cooking equipment, the, even down to the smallers, it all matters for guests. And it's a, one of those gut feels as a, as a customer that you walk in that you can tell something's off 
if those things have not been maintained well. Right. Because as a consumer, like, you know, I have two young kids, you know, three and five, and it takes a lot to leave the house. And if I'm going to go there and sit down in a restaurant, you know, I want, I want the experience to be great. I want the table to not wobble. I want the lights to work. I want the, um, the cushion to not have holes in it. You know, that's all, um, you know, basic expectations to your point. And then the food and the service kind of, you know, either makes the restaurant a place I will go back, you know, with my family or never drive by that place again. Right. And, and I don't think, um, just in general, people appreciate how important that initial few moments are when a consumer walks through the door. Like that either tells them this is a warm, inviting space that you're going to have a good time at, or it's going to be transactional where you just come in, eat your food and leave, and then you just don't think about it, right? Yeah. You know, I heard, I heard something the other day from one of our guests and they said, um, it was really, really interesting. They said, uh, your care in taking care of the bathrooms or care in taking care of the floor is an indication of the quality of the food that comes out of the kitchen, right? And if, if operators really understood that, how much care would you take on every detail? Because like you said, I don't think they're outlandish. It's just, they can stay home in the comfort of their home where the, the, the seat cushions aren't ripped, where the paint isn't falling off the, the walls, where the tile isn't broken and have a great meal. So if we want to invite them in, we need to make sure it's truly an invitation into our home. And that home is clean, pristine, prepped, ready to go with smiles and really hospitable people. Yeah. So, so let's talk about some macro trends, right? I mean, the restaurant industry seems to be booming right now. I mean, the last time I think I heard some stats, I think John Taffer gave them uh, at, at the, one of the Murtech conferences. Um, he shared that in-house dining is back to pre-COVID levels. And, you know, historically, take cuts have been 5% or so of the business. Today, it has boomed to like 20 to 25% of the business. So the overall pie has gotten bigger. Like the business is, has grown by 20 to 30%. Um, one, like, do you still see that trend today? And, and how does that impact how restaurants think about the business and how they invest in their consumer? Yeah, I, mean, I spent a lot of time looking at industry trends. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Black Box or NAP or some of these other organizations, but I spent a lot of time looking at sales and traffic. And I, I think the, the comment made earlier that the restaurant has kind of returned to these pre, pre-COVID le- levels. They're strong and they've added additional meals um, more than they ever had before without adding additional day parts. And I think that's interesting because that's what you get from these delivery companies and what you get from the to-go aspect. And that's where the pot has grown. I think the interesting thing that I, I continue to watch closely is the pricing dynamic and the inflationary dynamic that hmm. still kind of got this hangover where companies and restaurant companies had continued to take price to keep pace. And, and as they've come back around this, this new year, and they're starting to cycle year over year, they're realizing that the consumer is well aware. They're well aware that that, that, that restaurant company took 6 to 8% last year on the check. And some of those people are char- starting to choose with their dollars to go to different places. McDonald's just had a conversation about this, about getting back to a more value consumer and appealing to that value consumer because they had kind of left them from the mm. pricing. So, so you're, I, I think it, there's this, there's this hole, right? There's this, Hey, we've got a boom going on and we're, we're supplementing more meals than we ever had before with dining opportunities, but we've got this inflationary pricing aspect that's kind of pulling back on consumers. And now they're trying to, they're starting to be very selective on where they spend their money. Um, so it goes as far as it did pre COVID. Interesting. So, you know, if you look at the past three years, I mean, we were talking about expectations, right? It just feels like today there's a lot more choices. Um, Consumers have higher expectations than they had before COVID happened. Um, They're also interacting with the brands in more ways than before, right? Like today, you know, you can order from the restaurant's own website. You could use Uber. Uh, eats you could use DoorDash, you could use you know a host of other services, um, and then ultimately like how do it, that food is delivered to your door also impacts the experience you're having. 
plus it impacts the in-room uh, dining experience, right? So if I'm going to now compete with the kitchen and with Uber Eats and DoorDash for how quickly my meal is served while I'm in the restaurant, you know, that's probably going to impact like how restaurants think about their business and how they're able to serve the customer where they are. So can you share a little bit about, you know, one, how are the physical locations changing to adapt to today's world? And then two, how do you ensure that all the touch points that a restaurant or a brand has with a consumer are consistent and as per your expectation? Yeah, the latter part of that question is probably the tougher one, uh, but, but I'll, I'll talk to them in, in the same sequence you, you asked them. So I think first and foremost, um, the restaurant physical structure um, has been slow to change up until the point of about COVID, right? It's right. just been, this is the way we do it. There's a front door, there's a host, or you come through the line. This is what happens. This is how we, how we do things around, right? I think COVID, sh COVID shook the rest. Well, I know it shook. It shuttered us, right? right? And we realized really quickly, if we want to stay in business, if we want to continue to meet the guest needs, we got to think outside of the box. And then you saw all of these kind of infrastructure changes start to take place in the restaurant. Oh my gosh, if our business is going to pivot with a mix more towards premise or delivery, we got to have a way in order to pack those orders, make sure we get the right items in the bag, make sure it's fast and efficient, right? Um, guests now are coming in with their mobile phones. That can completely change the dynamic of an in-restaurant experience, right? Do we have charging capabilities? Are people going to interact with the with When I walk up to to um, ask for the order, if I'm the if I'm the wait staff, it, I've seen it. It takes minutes and minutes and minutes for people to actually review the menu because they're waiting and screwing around on their phones or doing something, or it changes the dynamic. So the physical restaurant has and will continue to evolve based on this consumer insatiable desire to have mobility in their hands, yeah. convenience at their fingertips. And, um, and, and I do think there will always be a place for it. put the phone down, sit down, sit eye to eye, have a great conversation and eat a great meal. That will probably at its core stay pretty sound. Like there may right. be some evidence in how you order different things, but the physical locations of how we get food out the door, how people work in the restaurant, how the lines look, how mobile mobility continues to change. That, that's going to continue to evolve. And the smart restaurant concepts are starting to look at their mix and understand and know their customers. Okay, um, where do our customers come? Are they the same? Are they different occasions? Right. Are they different people? Which then leads to the next part of that question, which you ask is how do you make sure that each one of those touch points are seamless, integrated, they don't feel disconnected and disjointed, right? I think that that's where that's, you were going with right. that question. That's right. So that latter part leads right into, okay, well, physical infrastructure is one piece of that, but it's also now this world that lives in the, in the digital world. How do you replicate the, the, the great physical structure that you've had for years to be just as easy? So let me give you an example. When I walk into Costa Vida Fresh Mexican Grill, I walk in and I see the menu board I quickly make a decision and I greet somebody who knows how this process works and they take me almost by the hand, right, across from the counter and they walk me down the line to get the right tortilla, to make the right beans, get the perfect protein, add all the extras that I want and make sure I get a great drink and a dessert to have a fantastic meal. That's taken care of in the physical structure. You yeah. have to replicate that to some extent in the digital world now as everybody's kind of running to this digital place. And so how do you make it so simple, so easy, big, bold pictures, minimal text, very intuitive design in your web and app so that guests feel just as at ease going through your web and app experience as they would if they just walked in your restaurant and met your, uh, your, your tortilla maker right behind the, the line and he or she led you down that process. So each one of those touch points have to be really, really refined. Delivery is the same thing. We're, we're kind of at the mercy of our, of our partners over there at DoorDash, Uber, Grub, and the like, but our, our voices are not lost. So helping them understand the importance of, hey, these are the things that matter in the design. These are the things that matter with the food. We, we want to make sure that those are front and center to our guests. So I think as you think through each, each one of those touch points, you have to be very focused on ins ensuring the guest doesn't get lost or frustrated with that experience. 
Right. I mean, and, and the consumers, so they have optionality, even like at the physical location, right? You know, drive throughs have made a comeback. You know, what are your thoughts on, on drive throughs Like, are they, that's something which, like, you know, became very evident that it was going to uh, make a comeback during COVID. Um, but it seems like that trend has continued because now consumers are like, oh, I like this option, right? So it's not that you can only have that option, but if you do it well, it's another avenue through which you interact with your consumer. Um, you know, I'm sure restaurants have to expand their kitchen or, you know, divide how their kitchen, you know, services, takeouts and, and, um, and drive-throughs and in-room dining. And all that needs folks within the restaurant business yeah. to think about design and, and construction. Like, how, how is that, how does that make its way through to someone you know, like you, who's thinking about customer engagement, who's thinking about, you know, keeping the same brand experience. Like, how, how is that connected? It's, it is critical that the structure of the restaurant and the multiple make lines in order to facilitate the different channels in which the, the food goes is absolutely critical in providing an optimal guest experience. So as I think about it, um, and I've had this conversation with our head of operations and, and our head of design and development, um, we, we now have gone to the place where, and you're right, first of all, drive throughs have made a comeback, right? right. And, and, and no, no small way with the big players out there, the McDonald's, the, the Chipotle, the other players, because they've made it a priority of convenience. Yeah. We're, we're seeing it in our business. What we've learned inside from a construction standpoint and from a development standpoint is we have to make sure that we have individual processes and lines associated with those channels. So let me give you an example. When we have, uh, if we're in our restaurant, we have a make line, that's what we call it, right? Where you make the food and you put it together for the guests. Yep. yep. That's dedicated to the in-restaurant experience. It goes really smoothly. Hmm. When you try to pile on a to-go and or a drive-through and or a delivery on that same make line, it gets chaotic. Items get missed. Guests get frustrated on all fronts. So what we're now focused on is as we've changed the construction aspect of the restaurant, we make sure it leans towards facilitating where the, where the guests need to get their food. So now we have a make line in just delivery, or sorry, in just a drive-through. That's just the make line. Then we'll have another make line for the guest. And sometimes we'll have a third, in many cases, we have a third make line that's just, go, just for to go and delivery. And we're routing all of the kitchen, all of the kitchen display systems are being routed the right point of sale information per that order to ensure that that group of individuals are just working on the orders related to that channel. And when we do that, man, our business runs super smooth. We can bring more volume in and we get better guest ratings across the board. That's very interesting. So what are your thoughts on, on people and talent? Because one of the things we also hear about is, you know, there's all these changes that you need to make, but there's also this whole, you know, primary notion of, meeting the customer and delighting the customer. And sometimes if you don't have enough people to man the lines and, and serve the guests, you know, you're competing for the same resource, right? Have you, have you found in your business that, um, you know, finding people who can uh, really do what you need them to do is, is easy? Because there seems to be a yeah. shortage uh, of labor as well in the market right now, right? Yeah, it, it's not easy. I mean, I wish yeah. I had the answer to this. And, and, and be, to be honest, many of the states in the United States are making it harder as we continue to ratchet up that minimum requirement of pay to where, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really difficult to find people, one, who love this industry and want to be in it, yeah. and then two, who are committed to the task to ensure the guest has a phenomenal experience. I mean, you know this as well as I do. When you meet somebody who's truly hospitable, it's a warm handshake. You just want to be That's around right. them, have a beer with them, hang out with them, right? That's right. Um, not everybody has that characteristic. And so th this is the battle we constantly struggle with. I, I do think that um, this will continue to be a battle, but I, I, there's hope on the horizon. And I say that because I believe that through some computer vision, some smart AI operations, we're going to get to a place where the job in the restaurant will become easier to ensure that you're delivering a high quality product, the right items, the right quality uh, ingredients. Um, but the task to know exactly how to do that will be offloaded 
you know, in a big way to the computing systems. Yeah. So think of it like um, a, a double checker for me, right? I'm going fast. I've got people coming in. I'm being hospitable. I forgot to add the cilantro. I think there will be AI solutions that will join us and say, no, no, hey, you forgot that. Quickly add that. And let's, let's make this a great experience. And that can be a game changer for our industry as we continue to want to be a people first industry. We're battling with these higher wages every day in the restaurant space, but we need the turnover uh, or we're constantly dealing with this turnover battle and we need that to go down. So I think that's where the hope on the horizon is, is it lies within this AI operations or computing vision operation solution um, that, that I've started to catch wind of or see that could potentially change our industry. Yeah. I mean, the hospitality business is a tough business, right? In general. I mean, there's so many factors to creating a great experience and you know, the associate who's in the restaurant serving your, your customer needs to also be in the right mind space. I mean, the physical space has to be comfortable. So if your physical spaces, you know, don't have the air conditioning working or something's not right and it's not something which, you know, would be pleasant to be in for 12 hours a day, they're not going to have a smile on their face and they're not going to welcome your guest with that same kind of, um, you know, warmth. Um, and then now you put it, throw in the fact that, you know, there's less resources um, and so what we're seeing is restaurants leveraging, like you said, AI and, and robotics and technologies to actually augment um, the resources that are available. And so then you can then make it easier for the associate to basically spend time at the front of house and the back of house and not be exhausted, right? What are your thoughts on like how that's going to, you know, um, improve or become a a very natural part of our life going forward, because as an operator, you see one thing, right? If it's back of house, but also like front of house, we're seeing some interesting things being done, like with robotics, you know, t you know, robots, you know, um, bussing your tables or delivering your drinks and uh, some very cool and interesting things happening out there. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I believe in this space. I, I think it is the only way, and you hit it on the head when you said, you can't deliver a fantastic experience if you yourself are in an uncomfortable situation or uncomfortable experience, right? And you think back to those team members that are making an hourly wage, you want them to be happy, hospitable, warm smiles, engaging. But if their feet are killing them and the work is just uh, grinding to where they're not happy, it's going to be really hard for them to have that smile on their face and be hospitable. So I do think there's going to come a point, and it's already started, right? I, I I've been working on some of these things even before when I was at Brinker and now even here at Costa Vida of how do you want to improve the team members experience, but two, how do you just improve um, the overall restaurant experience so that people can be more of the, uh, less of the manual element and more of the hospitable and thinking element. Right. Because that's what we really want, right? At that's the end right. of the day, we're not, we're not worried about who's scooping the, the orange chicken. We're worried about that it's done correctly with the tent and um, shared appropriately with the guest, right? That's what really, really matters. And then if something got missed, they can immediately step in and solve that. So I am very, very passionate that this industry will have to evolve and not terribly dissimilar to think about a manufacturing line when they were building cars 25, 30 years ago, there right. was no robotic arms, right? It was people right. stapling stuff together and tacking stuff together. Now you've got a whole robotics component, but people oversee that. They're using their minds to kind of get this, this component. I think the same thing you, you've seen, you're going to see, or you, we have seen. So we saw it in, in manufacturing. I, I think you're going to start to see it in all walks of life that have an element of fairly manual, laborious type activities, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm big on that. What are, what are your thoughts on the consumer? Like, you know, is the consumer ready for, for this kind of change? Because... You know, the restaurant business, like the hospitality business hasn't changed in many ways, you know, for years, right? Like, you know, consumer expectations, you know, you, you walk in and you, you, there's a certain, um, there's a certain expectation you have when you walk in through the door of what does it mean to eat at a restaurant, right? But now with robotics and then actually even for deliveries, right? I've, I've heard you, you know, speak about drones being tried out, autonomous vehicles being used. Um, is the consumer ready for that kind of change? Are they embracing it? Or are some of these things going to just require time for people to embrace it, you know, and 
and be comfortable with what it means to order food or go in and eat in a restaurant. Yeah, I, th I think we're bleeding edge, right? So I think people who are working with drones and robotics and arm robotics and AI stuff, it's still very bleeding edge. I mean, think about how much that your life, your both of our lives have changed since the iPhone came out in 2008. That's right. right? I mean, it, it has, we all think about it, but there's no more alarm clocks. There's no more radios. There's like everything that we had a gadget for, it's all been condensed into one that we carry in our pocket. And, right. and, I, and I use that because it was a massive shift when it happened. And it was, there was probably some resistance and probably some confusion around it. But as we got into it, it became the expectation. I, I, I think it's important to know when a Walmart or when an everyday walk of life, big uh, restaurant chain or a big restaurant or a, a grocery company starts to move in this direction and it starts to become commonplace, everything shifts, right? Everything has to shift because the expectation has now shifted. And that's what we're starting to see. We're starting to see some things with some big companies getting ready to make some announcements with robotics and drones and autonomous vehicles that will set the standard of what the new norm is. So your question to me was, are people ready for it? I think we're still bleeding edge, but I think we're closer than we've ever been to see this tip and become the new norm and, and customers expect it. As you look into the future, you know, kind of building on the answer you just gave, what does, what does a guest experience look like 10 years from now? Um, and just the hospitality industry in general, uh, how, are we talking about a 20% shift in how things are today? Or are we talking about like complete transformation uh, and disruption, kind of like, you know, what the iPhone did for, for um, you know, our phones and telecommunication? I'm a bit more pragmatic in, in, my, in my casting to the future. I actually don't, I mean, we've been going to restaurants since, I don't know, Roman times, right? On the, on the right. road to Rome and stop off and grab a bite to eat at, at a low location of somebody's home that was, that was feeding you. So I, I can't believe that dining and dining out will have a, um, you know, such a paradigm shift or such a, you know, a watershed moment that all of that will just massively go away. Like, I just don't think that's going to happen. There's always going to be a fundamental core of wanting to connect around a table um, yeah. Need to be eye to eye and, and in, a, in a physical location That's right. and, and having food. Um, but as I look to the future, I think the biggest shift that people, that, that I would predict to be, will be every one of these channels, every channel to get food will become easier to get. So whether it's delivery, whether it's off premise, whether it's drive through, well, all these things will only get easier and easier and more seamless. And I think they will become more and more tethered with whatever it is, the proverbial iPhone or Oracle or whatever that we're using to ask it to get me, I think that's where the, the, the convenience will be. So today we have to go to a website, we have to go through an ordering process and we have to submit it. I believe that the future 10 years out will be that the device in which we actually interact with will be more or, or less visible, right? It'll be more a part of us and the, the, the process will be more verbal commands or heaven forbid thinking commands, but it will just be more seamless in order to make that happen. Um, and I think that's the real, the, the, the movement that will happen in dining. It'll be less around that we don't sit down at tables and, you know, I think that's still gonna happen. And yeah, we'll, we'll have some robotics and we'll have some things that happen, but only if it makes the experience better, less clunky and less friction, or, or yeah, with less friction. I love that. Yeah, I think you're hundred percent right. I think at its, at its core, you know, food and, and, you know, dining is a way that connects us and it's about family and friendships um, and it's about the human interaction. And so I think that won't change everything around it that helps enable a better seamless experience. That might change. And I think we just, you know, as, as, as an industry have to be prepared for it. Like adapting is going to be the, the name of the game, right? That's right. Yeah. Totally agree. So, so are there any technologies or trends that are not ubiquitous, that are not known or being spoken of today that, you know, you being on the inside, you know, uh, have maybe preview to or have seen or have heard of or getting wind of that excites you 
that you think like you know will will play a role in in a few years from now? Well, the one I'll just talk to the one that I'm super excited about the last couple of days um, or weeks is is uh, we kind of we kind of addressed it, but not in its specificity. Um, computer vision is is something that I just think is remarkable. You know this this ability to have uh, compute on premise, but store things in the cloud, and to do it in such a way that would capture video to either enhance the team member's experience or enhance the guest experience. And, and I think we, we talk about these things, but we don't really, we can't really grasp them until we put them into an application. And one of the applications I've recently kind of stumbled across is this ability to make sure that we get the right item in the bag in the to-go world. And right. that is so hard to do. I know that sounds crazy. There's a the kitchen display system. There's the order have a process, bag it up. But when the world is exploding at 6.30 on a Friday night and you've got yeah. 30, you're back 30 orders, you're just flipping food in as fast as you can go. But to see this way, this what could be with computing vision to, to help our operators reduce the guests with a problem is massive. I mean, it is massive. And it's massive not just for our organization of 100 restaurants, but it is, the total addressable market is billions of dollars returned to restaurants because every time you miss an item in an off-premise experience, you not only ruin that meal, but you, you, you're giving up future meals because of the guest's bad experience not wanting to come back because they're afraid that you're going to do it again. So for me right now, that tech, that, that kind of computer vision with AI processing in the cloud with compute on the edge is really, really interesting in just that application. But I think there's probably 10 other applications in the restaurant that it could, that could, it could change our industry. I love it. That, that sounds fascinating. Um, well, with that, I just want to say a huge thank you, Wade. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for taking the time. Sid, thanks, man. It's been awesome being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. And for folks in our audience who might want to look you up or, or find you, where can they find you? I'm a LinkedIn guy. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Wade Allen. Uh, just search for for my name and my mug, you'll find me. And I'd love for people to, to link in. I'm a, I'm a huge connector. I love it. Perfect. Well, with that, I just want to say a huge thank you again. And to all in our audience, thank you for joining us. And I'll see you on the next episode of Elevating Brick and Mortar. Well, that was Wade Allen, EVP of Strategic Growth at Costa Vida. Today, Wade and I discussed the state of the restaurant industry in a post-COVID world and the changes we're seeing for both restaurant brands and customers. We all know this, it's easier than ever to stay home. So restaurants need to do everything they can to make their spaces appealing, comfortable, and more efficient. Wade is really passionate about the importance of the guest experience beyond the restaurant physical walls as well. He shared not only how restaurants are dealing with this today, but how technology will transform how brands deliver a great experience in the future. One thing's for sure, Adapting is going to be the name of the game. Thanks for listening. With that, I'm your host, Sid Shetty, and I'll see you on the next episode of Elevating Brick and Mortar. Operations and facilities teams across industries rely on Service Channel to ensure that their locations provide the best possible guest experience. Keep customers coming back by lowering downtime and raising your brand standards. Visit servicechannel.com to learn more.